Inside, it's comfortable. Inside a house, inside a family, inside a routine. But what if we widen our view beyond the fence across the street? Outside, we find people struggling with loneliness, poverty, families that don't look like ours, or without a safe family at all. Jesus didn't call us to live by our neighbors. He called us to love our neighbors. Well, good morning, Community Christian Church. How are we? Oh, you all can do better than that. Come on now. It's been good worship, good meditations. How are we this morning? Oh, that's better. Good, good, good. If you're new around here, my name is Bart. I'm one of the ministers. It is great to meet you. We are currently in week three of a four-week series that we are calling How to Neighbor. And so this whole series is all about diving into how does Jesus want us to neighbor? So how does Jesus want us to neighbor? And to get into this sermon today, I thought I would share a story from a friend of mine. His name is Joe Boyd. Uh, he shared a story about his sister's doll when they were growing up. And this is what Joe says. Her name was Candy. She had lost most of her hair. One of her arms was hanging on by a thread. And generally speaking, she was missing most of her stuffing. But she was still my sister's favorite doll. To my sister, Sandy, Candy was beautiful. Sandy loved her. She loved her with a love that was so strong that it wasn't even good for Candy. <laughs> for when Sandy went to bed at night, Candy always laid next to her. When Sandy had lunch, Candy sat beside her. When Sandy could get away with it, Candy would even take baths with her. Sandy's love for that doll was nearly a fatal attraction. By the time I knew Candy, she definitely was not particularly attractive. In fact, to tell you the truth, Candy was a mess. She was no longer a very valuable doll. I'm not sure that, that we could even have given her away. But for some reason that no one could really figure out, in a way that kids sometimes do, my sister Sandy loved that little rag doll no matter what. She seemed to love her even more in those ragged days than in her days of beauty. And other dolls came and went, but Candy was the only one for Sandy. And I remember once we went on vacation and Candy had to go with us to Florida. And we were almost halfway home when Sandy realized that Candy wasn't with us. And there was no other option but to turn around and go back to the hotel. So my father turned the car around and we drove all the way back to our hotel in Florida. We were a devoted family, particularly not bright, but devoted. We rushed to the hotel and checked in with the front desk and there was no candy. We went back to the room and still no candy. We ran downstairs and checked with housekeeping and there wrapped in the bed sheets was candy for we saved her from being washed to death. And years had passed, and my sister grew up. She outgrew Candy. She traded Candy for a boyfriend named Randy, who, oddly enough, was less attractive than the, do the doll Candy. And Candy had not been played with in a really long time, and so there was no logical reason to keep her. Our mom asked Sandy if they could get rid of candy, but she refused. So they wrapped candy in some tissue paper and put her in a shoebox and put her in the attic for storage. 20 years had passed. And my sister had gotten married, not to Randy, but a man that was much better looking. And they moved far away, and my sister had three little children. Her youngest name was Kelly. And one day, Kelly wanted a doll. So Sandy went back to our childhood home and went up to the attic and got out of the box candy. Candy was even more rag than doll at this point, and it didn't matter. Sandy sent candy to a doll hospital to be fixed up. I didn't even know such a thing existed. But a doll hospital exists to fix your doll. Candy was fixed right up. And after 30 years, she became, once again, as beautiful on the outside as she has always been to Sandy. Now, Sandy really loved Candy, but didn't love Candy because the rag doll was beautiful. 
It's because Candy wasn't really beautiful. But Sandy loved her with the kind of love that made her beautiful. I love that last line. I love that last line that Sandy loved her with the kind of love that made her beautiful. And you know why I love that last line? Because this is how God loves us. This is the kind of love that God has for you and for me. For you see, there's a difficult truth today that we're going to have to deal with, is that we are all ragdolls. We are all ragdolls. We are all flawed. We are all wounded. We are all broken. We are all messy. We all have made mistakes. We are all sinners. We are all dirty. Some of our raggedness is due to the things that we have done. Some of the raggedness is due to the things that others have done to us. Maybe our parents didn't really parent us in the best of ways. Maybe our genes have given us some certain weaknesses. Maybe there's broken relationships and disappointing losses and hurtful experiences that have just contributed to our raggedness. But I know that that is not the whole story about me, and that is not the whole story about you. But each of us have played a part in our own raggedness. The Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For we are all ragged. We have all done things that we're not supposed to do, and we have all not done things that we're supposed to do. We have all messed up. The prophet Isaiah really spells it out for us in Isaiah 64, 6. He says this, And all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy what? Rags. Because of our sins, our mistakes, our problems, our laziness, our foul-ups, that no matter how good we try to be, no matter how good our acts truly are in our eyes, they are still just dirty rags. For our acts by themselves are just filthy rags to a perfect and holy God. For we are a messy, broken people. But if you are in Christ, your raggedness is not your identity or your destiny. Nor is it mine because we are all God's ragdolls. We are his, and he has loved us with a love that makes us beautiful. For we are loved by a God that loves us so much that he gave his only son for us. And that if we accept him and are baptized into his name, then we are not defined by our raggedness. And our destiny is not determined by our raggedness. For God's love for us turns us ragged dolls into priceless treasures. For there is a love that fastens itself onto ragged little creatures for reasons that no one can really quite figure out and make them precious and valuable beyond calculation. This love is beyond compare. For this is the love of God. This is the love of God which loves you and me. And listen to me, everybody. When you have experienced this kind of love, this soul-shaping, mind-bending, heart-filling, life-giving love from God, God doesn't want you to do nothing with it. He doesn't want you just to keep it to yourself. He wants you to share that love. And when we've experienced this love, God wants us to express this love. And that is why we're doing this sermon series. For in the first week of the series, we saw an experience that Jesus had with a religious leader that was really trying to trick him. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, this expert comes along and it kind of asks, well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus fights back, fires back with another question. He's like, well, what does the scripture say, Mr. Religious Expert? And the guy immediately comes back and just says, oh, well, it's loving God with all of you, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor." And I think Jesus just looks at him square in the eye and says, you are correct, sir. Now go and do this. Do this and you will live. And what Jesus did in that one verse, everybody, is teach us that we are to do both. We are to do both. We are to love God with all of us and love people because all people matter to God. In other words, the two greatest commandments can be summed up by saying, love God and love his ragdolls. I mean, it's a package deal. John 3, 16, everybody knows this verse, even if you're not a Christian. 
For God so loved the what? The world that he gave his son. Not some of the world, but for the world. God loves all people, and we are to love God and love his ragdolls. So what if, what if we really practice this? I mean, what, what if, can you imagine a church where everyone lived and loved as if everybody mattered? I mean, what would that look like? That, that is why I have shared this good tool with you all when it comes to how to love your neighbor. And it's the who is your neighbor tool. It's been in every single sermon notes that you've had. It's been on the back tables for you to get. It's been on the screen for you to think about because what we want to do is we want to understand who is our neighbor so we know how we can treat them and how we can treat them like they matter. For if everybody matters to God and God matters to us, then our neighbors shouldn't matter to us as well. And we need to love our neighbors, but we first have to see our neighbors before we actually love them. So the first week, what I challenge you all to do is to fill this out. Is your house is in the middle, and this isn't just in your home or your neighborhood. This can be at work or at school or wherever you are. It's really anybody you come into contact with on a regular basis but you are to identify them. In the first week, I challenge you, pray for them. Just pray for them. Don't go talk to them yet, but just pray for them. And then the second week, I challenge you all to go and actually talk to them and ask them what you could pray for for them. And so this week, I want to challenge you to take another step. Go back to your neighbor and discuss what you prayed for them about. Discuss with them what you prayed for them about. Because I can make you a promise that if you do this, you will start to see how you can neighbor your neighbors better. You can see how you can love them like they matter. But, but to help you today, I kind of want to go even deeper with this, and I want to kind of go into this very fascinating section of Scripture, for Jesus in this section of Scripture gives us this remarkable picture of how to neighbor. And today, I want to look at three people Jesus neighbored in Luke chapter 7 to help us neighbor. But let me give you the context real quick. So the context is, is that Jesus just delivered the greatest sermon ever. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. If you don't know it, go check it out. It is the best sermon ever. And people were just astonished by Jesus' incredible speaking ability and his power and his incredible words. And, it was, and after all of this, people were coming up to him and going, wow, that was amazing. And they're telling each other, we've never heard things like this. Nobody's ever spoken like this before. And now, friends, put yourself in that moment. Just put yourself in that moment for a second that you preach the best sermon ever preached in history and it just has come out of your mouth. I mean, now you can imagine you would kind of be a big deal if you did that. The multitudes were amazed at the words of Jesus. But let me tell you what Jesus didn't do. Jesus didn't look into the camera next and say, I'm going to Disney World. Jesus didn't go find an agent in an office to make more money. He didn't sign a book deal. He, he, didn't, he didn't call a press conference. He didn't get on Facebook Live. He didn't go on tour to do the Sermon on the Mount tour. He didn't go on a talk show to promote himself. What does Jesus do? He heads home. And as he's heading home, he's, he's traveling through town after town after town. And this is where we kind of, that bumps where three different people that Jesus runs into that need neighboring. Now, I thought 50 verses would be a lot for us to kind of work through today. And kind of talk through. So I thought, as I usually do, I like visual aids, and I know you do too. So I want to walk through three visual aids to kind of help us through the 50 verses. The first one, the first person that Jesus runs into is a Roman soldier that really is known as a centurion in that culture. And this centurion is a high-ranking official, has lots of money, has lots of power. He has a servant and it's a sick servant, and he's about to die. And so, and I, as I think of this, ser this soldier servant, do you all know what this is? It's a shoeshine kit. So when I think of this, this boy that's a servant, I kind of think of a shoeshine boy. So I think this is kind of who Jesus kind of 
thought about when it came to this centurion. And I can imagine this servant just not only shining shoes, but he was probably also, you know, keeping the uniform clean and pressed. And I'm sure the, shine, the helmet had to be really shiny and clean the shield and make sure the sword was sharp and all those kinds of things. For don't all Roman soldiers have to look sharp? <laughs> but this certain soldier had the nerve to interrupt Jesus about his shoe shine boy. The shoe shine boy that was sick and dying. Now, if you had just delivered the greatest sermon of all time and you astonish many people, let me ask you would you mess? Would you even give them time? Would you even go and talk about helping a shoe shine boy? I mean, what do you do in life when life is so busy? And you are such a big deal, and something interrupts your busyness. I mean, we are all big deals, right? I mean, we're all crazy busy nowadays. I mean, how, like, we are now such a big deal, and all of a sudden, what, what happens if your cousin Eddie comes and their kid needs a job? Or what if you're such a big deal, and you go home, and you're in a hurry, too, and your neighbor needs help with unloading some mulch? But you're a big deal. So what do you do? What do you do when someone so insignificant comes along and asks for help? Later in Luke 7, Jesus passes through a town called Nain. Isn't that a weird name? And Jesus is obviously headed somewhere when he's interrupted by a funeral procession. I mean, this is a horse-drawn cart that's a hearse as well. So you can imagine that what this cart is pulling is a coffin, but not just any coffin, a coffin that's only big enough for a boy. And it's probably surrounded by flowers. There are people around it that are just wailing and crying out loud because this mom lost her son. Now, let me ask you, have you ever been in a hurry and you're running late, I mean really running late, and you get stopped at a red light, and you're anxious to hurry and get through the red light, you know, the red light is like not changing fast enough, and then all of a sudden you just notice this car going in front of you that's a hearse. Anybody, has that happened to anybody else? Can I be honest with you? Confessions, good for the soul, bad for the reputation. Here we go. I've sat at that light before and gone, I hope this person didn't have many friends. <laughs> I'm just being honest, gang. Right? Told you it's bad for the reputation. Because I was in such a hurry. Now, I feel bad for it. I ask God forgiveness, by the way. Right? But has anybody else felt that way? At least a little bit. Where you're like, oh, come on. Let's go. Let's move. I mean, how many cars are there? And what Jesus is going through probably in a hurry too. He's ready to get home. And then this funeral procession holds him up. And he sees this woman whose scripture says that she's already a widow, but she's now a widow grieving mom. In other words, she's already buried her husband. And now she has to go bury her son. And there are a lot of people around them. This procession is going really slow and long because of the pain, because of the sorrow, because of the loss. I mean, it has to be going really slow. And I mean, Jesus being Jesus, I mean, he could just kind of go around it. He could just crash through it. So how well do you love when something as precious as your time is threatened? What do you do when someone makes you late for an appointment? What do you do when your food server takes twice as long as you think they should take? I mean, I mean, what do you do when it takes you forever to get through the right now the Walmart parking lot that looks like a bomb just went off? I mean, what do you do? Then we have the third interaction. We have this third interaction, and Jesus is at a social event. And this social event 
is really kind of the biggest social event of the week, and something embarrassing happens to Jesus, and Jesus is having dinner at the home of this religious leader, and this relig- re- religious leader really would love to trip up Jesus or trick Jesus or discredit him because he didn't really like Jesus. But word has gotten around town that Jesus was there, and out of nowhere, the neighborhood prostitute shows up. sinful woman from the street corner in her high heels probably her daisy duke shorts her top that was probably made out of dental floss but she's reeking of the perfume that prostitutes wear and this sex worker takes her place not outside where she belongs but at the very feet of jesus and burst out in tears but not like little tears I'm talking like Niagara Falls kind of tears with snot bubbles. And she is wiping her tears off his feet with her hair. So friends, let me ask you, what do you do when people catch you off guard and break into your perfectly protected life and schedule? What do you do when you're just coming off when you did something big and you're kind of a big deal now? And you feel really important, and then someone comes along that maybe isn't as important as you are in this world and wants your attention, wants your love, wants your time. I mean, what do you do when someone is hurting? Or what do you do when someone with a messy, ragged life puts you in a very embarrassing public situation? You know how Jesus reacted every single time? In all three scenarios, all three scenes. All three pictures. Jesus responded that Jesus loved them anytime and anywhere. For Jesus stops and shows concern for the forgotten shoe shine boy and heals him and makes him well. Jesus is moved by the compassion of the grieving widow mom with a funeral procession that, that is messing with his schedule and making him late. And he touches the coffin, and when he touches the coffin, he resurrects the son and brings him back to life. With a heart filled full of amazing grace, he stops. He extends forgiveness to the person with the most ragged, messy life and tells her that her sins are forgiven, that you are not your past. Your sins are wiped away. Can you imagine how that felt for that weeping rag doll? I mean, some of us, because we remember, I mean, some of us remember the day that we cried out to God in the middle of one of our big sins, and we we remember the time that we thought, there is no way that I can be forgiven for this mess that I've made. And many of you can remember the moment when you sensed that Jesus was saying, I see your tears. I know your hurt. I see your ragged sin. I know your repentance is real, and it's over. You belong to me, and I give you grace. And friends, this is what it means to neighbor. You see, we love God and we love his ragdolls. So imagine a church where everyone lived and loved as if everybody mattered. What would that look like? What would that look like? Which really begs the question, then what does this neighboring require of us? What does this neighboring require of me and you? And I want to get really practical with you all of what does neighboring really require of us? And I think that the first encounter with a a soldier shoe boy kind of helps us. That Jesus teaches us that instead of waiting around for someone else to help, is that we need to personally do something. We need to do something. What I love about Jesus is that he loves anywhere and anytime. I mean, think about this. Whether people are rich or poor, whether it's personal or a public scene, whether Jesus knows them or doesn't, even if it's just a shoonshine boy, Jesus loves them, and he's neighboring to them, no matter what. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 says this, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with what? Actions and in truth. So instead of just waiting around for someone else to help, what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to do something, which makes me think of my grandfather. This is a picture of him. That's my grandfather, Andy Dale. We called him Papa Dad. He was the best grandfather in the world. Then you have Declan right beside him. I mean, me. 
than my two sisters. But I'll never forget, it was around the time of this picture, that my grandfather, my papa dad, was the best. He always gave us candy. He always gave us money and gifts. I mean, he was the preaching professor at Kentucky Christian College for over 40 years, so he was very intelligent, but he was a prankster. He was a jokester. He loved jokes, especially the corny ones, okay? One of his favorite things to do at KCC was to walk around campus and walk up to a college student and say, are you hungry? And they'd always be like, yes, because what college student isn't hungry, right? And he'd say, oh, would you like a chicken dinner? And they'd all be like, yeah, we'd love a chicken dinner. Then what he'd do is he'd reach in his pocket and pull out some corn and put it in their hand and say, that's what chickens eat. Enjoy. (laughs) You get it? Takes you a minute, but it's so cheesy. But you got to love him for it. But he loved good jokes. But, you know, that's not what I really remember him as. It's not really what I remember him most for. Because I remember this one time. He asked me to go to Ralph's grocery store with him. And we got in his car. And I got in the passenger seat. And this was before kids' seats and seat belts even. But I get in this car, and we drive down the road. And all of a sudden, he stops. And I can't see anything because I'm not tall enough to see above the dashboard. So he pulls over, and he stops, and he gets out really quickly. And I get out. And you know what I see him doing? He's helping someone change a flat tire. I mean, he immediately stopped. And he, did, he changed the tire for him, and we got back in the car, and I asked him, Papa, Dad, why did you do that? And he told me, Bart, it's because if I don't stop to help, then who will? I remember that because most people nowadays, even I catch myself, have the opposite mindset. They think, well, someone else will do that. I don't have to stop. <laughs> but not my Papa, Dad. He was always the first one to do something for someone. After he had passed and I grew older, I found out all these stories of who he was and what he did, that he was the first to give food to the hungry person, comfort someone that was heartbroken, stand up for someone, pray with someone, give clothes to them, or stop just to change a tire. He always did something for someone because they mattered to God and God mattered to him. For he personally did something, and so should we. For the second point, is we see this in the funeral procession. We see this in Jesus' interaction with the funeral procession, is that our inconveniences are often opportunities. Whatever inconveniences us is oftentimes an opportunity. I mean, it would have been way easy for Jesus just to go another route, to, to go around the town because he already knew the funeral was going on because he's Jesus. He could have avoided making eye contact with the widow. He could have headed another direction, but what looked like an inconvenience, was actually an opportunity. For a couple of months ago here, it was right after a morning worship service. And, and we concluded the service, and of course, you all always shake hands and talk to everybody, and I love it, and I was shaking hands and talking to everybody, and everybody I thought was gone. So I was shutting everything down, and I walk out in the foyer, and there's a couple sitting out there in the foyer, and they're just crying. And I walk over to them, because I'm their minister, I need help, you know? So I just pat them on the shoulder, and I'm like, hey, is everything okay? Can I help you with something? And they go on to share with me that they had invited a young lady to church, and she came that that day. And what they didn't realize is that she was coming first off, but then she was just crying through the whole worship service. And after the worship service concluded, they went into the hub, and she just opened up about her life, about everything that was going on and everything else. And she's crying, and they're crying. And then they just asked her if she had any plans that afternoon. She said no, so they said, hey, how can we take you out to lunch and hang out with you a little bit? And they were crying because she was in the restroom trying to clean up. But what they shared with me later on is that that's not what they had planned that day. (laughs) Their plans were to go to Lexington and run some really important errands. But they invited her to lunch instead. You see, they saw this person that was right in front of them that mattered to God, and so it mattered to them. That even though it was an inconvenience, they still saw the opportunity and leveraged it. For this is what Paul tells us in Ephesians 5. It says, but be very careful. Then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, 
making the most of every what? Opportunity. Because the days are evil. The inconvenience was actually an opportunity. Then the third point, the third interaction, was the woman who worked on the street corners. See, don't keep God's love to yourself. We have to share God's love. But you all know in 20 miles of this building, there is over 150,000 people, people who matter to God, people who need to be loved, and God has entrusted us with this for some reason. I believe that God is testing our church as a church for the forgotten of this world like the shoeshine boy. And I believe that he is testing our love for the hurting people of this world like the grieving mother. And I believe that he's testing our love for people that are far from him in this world who need a new beginning and a second chance. For the Apostle John always has so much to say about love. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 11 says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So God has put Community Christian Church in London, Kentucky, with you here today, not by accident, but on purpose. On purpose to show all the rag dolls who desperately need to encounter the supernatural love of God. They are our neighbors, our friends, our family, our people who, that we work with, the people we go to school with. For they are searching for anything and everything to find meaning and purpose in this life. And they're trying the new fads that are on social media or on YouTube. They're trying therapy and medicine and seminars and books and drugs and hookups and hobbies and extreme sports and recreation. And more and more and more to try to fill the emptiness that is inside of them but they will never feel that emptiness without Jesus without his love and it's time that we love the ones that are forgotten the ones that are hurting and the ones that are imperfect for God says the two greatest things that we can do is to love him and love his rag dolls gang it's a package deal Jesus bumped into this Roman soldier to try to get help for his shoeshine boy. But you know what? He thinks he may be a rag doll, but Jesus is like, he's my rag doll. You see, Jesus stumbles across this grieving mom and a widow and says, she may be a rag doll, but she's my rag doll. Jesus encounters this prostitute in the most inopportune time and says, she may be a rag doll, but she's my rag doll. And even today, Jesus looks at the homeless people and he says, hmm, they may be a rag doll, but they're my rag doll. Jesus looks at the strung out addic addicted people and says, they may be a rag doll, but they are my rag doll. Jesus looks at the gender confused people that we have in our culture today and he says, they may be a rag doll, but they are my rag doll. He may look at your boss that doesn't treat you with any kind of respect, but he says, they are a rag doll, but they are my rag doll. He may look at your spouse or your kid or your, or, or your friend or someone that's not treating you right, that you're having struggles with right now, and he wants you to hear that they may be a rag doll, but they are his. For Jesus is saying, if you love me, then love my rag dolls. So can you imagine a church where everyone lived and loved as if everybody mattered to God? which leads us to the final question. So who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Let this question remind you over the next coming days to come <laughs> that God is counting on you to neighbor his ragdolls. So won't you neighbor his ragdolls? For those ragdolls matter to God and we need to live like they matter to us. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity we have to come before you, to not only see ourselves as rag dolls because we are so imperfect, but to look around and see the people that are around us that you love, that you want a relationship with, and that you've called us to be like Jesus. So we thank you, Lord God, for our neighbors. And now we thank you for the opportunity to be able to see them so that we can love them because we know you love them. So open our eyes to see, Lord God. 
of what we can do to show them your love and your grace and your truth. For we can only do this in the name of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So we just want to give you an invitation today that maybe you feel like you're a rag doll, and you are. <laughs> Without Jesus, you are definitely a rag doll. But I can tell you with Jesus, you're still a rag doll, but you're a loved rag doll. You're loved in a way that makes you beautiful. And if you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and been baptized into his name, today is your day to experience that love for the first time that makes you beautiful. Or maybe you just need to rededicate your life to Jesus. Maybe you need to come back to him because you lived that life that was away from him and now you realize it's time to come back. Or maybe you just need prayer. Whatever decision that you need to make, however it needs to be for you, that next step with Jesus, I can guarantee is that first step out of the pew and down the aisle. So won't you come? Won't you come as we stand and sing? Let's stand.